Hello and welcome to this lecture in Calculus 3. In today's video, I would like to talk a little bit about Green's Theorem. And specifically, I'd like to do a couple of examples. Uh, first, let's begin by remembering what Green's Theorem says. So in Green's Theorem, we assume that we have a region in the plane, which is bounded. So the region here is the interior of this blob that I've drawn. Okay, we'll call this region D, and this region is bounded by a simply a simple closed curve, okay, which is also known as a Jordan curve, and it's smooth in the piecewise smooth in the sense that um, we can parameterize it by smooth functions, and so the boundary curve positively oriented means that as we travel along the curve, the region, the bounded region, is to our left. So we'll call this boundary curve C. And then in this region, there's also a vector field defined. And the vector field has to obey the property that its component functions, P and Q, have continuous first derivatives. So this is what C1D means. It means continuous first derivatives. And remember, a vector field just assigns to every point in the region, including along the boundary but also in the whole region, it assigns a vector to each point. So Green's theorem says that under these conditions, the work done by the vector field around the positively oriented boundary, so the work is a path integral along C of f dot dr, this is equal to the double integral over the entire region of the function that we get by taking the partial derivative dx d, dq dx minus dp dy. And this is then an area integral. And so this is a version, it could be thought of as a version of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which says that our double integral along the two-dimensional region can be reduced to a one-dimensional path integral around the boundary. Okay, and so we're going to use this theorem to do a couple of examples in this video. The first example, uh, we're given a very interesting looking vector field. So in this scenario, uh, this function, this is the P of XY. So that's the X component. And this function is our Q of XY. That's the Y component of the vector field. Okay, and these, both of these functions uh, are differentiable. We can take the derivatives, and so they, they obey the C1 property. And according to Green's theorem, the path integral, f dot dr, is equal to the double integral around the, the interior of the region, which we haven't looked at the region yet, but uh, of the difference of uh, the partial derivative of q with respect to x minus dp dy, and this notation is just shorthand for those partial derivatives. And if we look at the curve that we were given here, this curve is a circle centered at the origin uh, of radius 3. So this is, I'll write it in blue, circle with a radius of 3. Okay, and so what we need to do then is we could try to parameterize this and carry out the path integral calculations, but the e to the sine of x is a little weird. The square root of the y to the fourth it looks like it might be a lot of work. So instead, we can apply Green's theorem, and we can take these partial derivatives. So let's start with dq dx, okay, and that's just going to be 7, derivative of 7x with respect to x, plus 0. The second term has no x terms. Okay. Similarly, we'll take dp dy. And when we look at the p function, the derivative with respect to y is 3, again, plus 0, because e to the sine of x has no y terms. So this is just 7 and 3. And if we plug these into Green's theorem, we find that this integral can actually be computed as the double integral over the interior of the region, the bounded region, of 7 minus 3 dA. Right? But 7 minus 3 is just a constant 4. This is the double integral of 1 dA, then, over the region D. But we know that this region D 
is just the circle, right? And so this is the area of the circle. So we don't even have to actually compute the integral. We can just use our knowledge of geometry to know that the area of the circle is pi r squared. So we've got our 4. And then we've got pi times the radius of the circle squared, which is 3 squared. And so altogether, this path integral must be equal by Green's theorem to just 36 pi. And that's all, that's all there is to it. Now, if you decide that you want to try to do the path integral by definition, um, you need to parameterize it and find the arc length element, and it becomes, it, 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 it's at least more writing, and some of the integrals might actually even be impossible to, to do. So Green's theorem makes this one fairly straightforward. Okay, so in that last example, we used Green's theorem to turn a path integral into an area integral. Um, but for the next example, let's do the opposite. Let's try to turn an area in integral into a path integral. And so for this one, I want to start with a general, uh, a general idea. So let's say we have a curve in, in the plane that is given by, so it's positively oriented, it bounds a region, right? But let's say that this curve is given by a polar function. So polar coordinates are r and theta, and let's say that this r is a function, the radius is a function of theta. Okay? In this scenario, we can use this to parameterize the points on the curve um, just by thinking about polar coordinates. Okay? So x can be thought of as a function of theta. X is r cosine theta, right? But r is itself a function of theta. And so the polar parameterization of the x coordinate is r of theta times cosine of theta. And similarly for y, we get r as a function of theta times sine of theta. Okay? And so this is just a parameterization of really uh, every point on the boundary curve. So this parameterizes the boundary curve. So we'll say that C is given by this polar function. Okay, but we want to use this to try to find the area of the region inside. And so as we just saw with the last example, the area of this region D is given by the double integral over the region D uh, of just one DA. Okay? And according to Green's theorem, uh, if we can find two functions... So if we can find two functions that satisfy dq dx minus dp dy is equal to 1, then we can turn this into a path integral by just finding those functions p and q. And so there's lots of different functions that satisfy this. There's some, some obvious choices um, that maybe are, are more obvious than what I'm about to choose, but we'll see that my choice is going to uh, have some nice consequences with the trigonometry here. So I'm going to choose here, I'm going to choose to have my q function equal one-half x, okay, so dq dx is one-half, and I'm going to choose the p function to be minus one-half y. So then dp dy is negative a half, but since they're subtracted, then Definitely dq dx minus dp dy is indeed one half plus one half, which is one. So this checks out, right? Okay, and so then this means that the area of the region that we care about can be written as a path integral along the boundary of the vector field that we just wrote down. So it, it's p then q, negative one half y comma, one-half x, dotted with dx dy. Okay, and so this becomes the integral around the boundary of, I'll pull out the one-half, and then it's negative y dx plus x dy after the dot product. So this is the area um, of any, this, is, this, this works for any uh, parameterized curve, but we're going to use this formula um, to find a formula for the area of a polar region, a region given by a polar curve.
Okay, so I'm going to move back over here now, and we need to plug in our parameterizations and see what happens here. So we've got our x and our y. We need to write down our dx and our dy. Okay, so since x in particular, let's start with x, since x is built as a product of functions, we need to apply the product rule here. And I'm going to suppress the theta on the r's, but if we take the derivative of this, this gives us r dot cosine of theta minus, so this is in parentheses, we're taking the derivative here, minus r by itself times sine of theta, d theta, and that's the dx component, right? This whole thing times d theta. And the dy component is going to be uh, very similar. It's going to be r dot times sine of theta, the derivative hits the r first, and then it goes to the sine, and that becomes r cosine theta. That's positive. The derivative of sine is positive cosine d theta. Okay, and then in our integral, we need to multiply these things by the opposite coordinate functions. And so we'll get this. So we'll have our negative y dx plus x dy equals, when the x is multiplied through by dy, or sorry, we do y first, so we'll have negative y times dx, we're going to have an r, r dot, cosine theta, sine theta, so that's y times the first component, uh, then we're going to have a minus r squared, sine squared theta, and I'm going to factor the d theta out of this whole thing. Um, then we're going to add in x dy. So I'll do it on the next line. This whole thing is going to be time. I'll put the d theta here just so we don't lose it. Um, x dy is going to be r, r dot, sine theta, cosine theta. So that's the same term for the first one. The second term is then plus r squared cosine squared theta. This is all d theta. And now we add these up and notice that because this one is negative, this goes in. And when these add up, the first terms are now the same but opposite sign, so they cancel. And the second terms are going to have sine squared plus cosine squared. That's just one. And so we end up with this integrand this entire integrand just becomes uh, r squared d theta. So our polar function squared d theta. And that can go back in to our area formula over here to give us a formula for our area that doesn't require us to redo all this work every time. And we just end up with our area of a polar region, a region bounded by a polar closed curve is one half of the integral around the boundary, r squared d theta. Okay, and if you think back to your basic trig trigonometry, this is exactly what it should be, um, because the area of a sector of a circle uh, is one half r squared times the change in the angle, d theta. Uh, so you just add this up and you get this, this answer makes perfect sense. But this, this comes from Green's theorem, and so we can just use it now. And to end out this little lecture, um, let's actually use it to find the area of one petal of the four-leafed rose. So this is a curve that looks something like this in the xy plane. So this curve will look something, that's not very good looks something like this and it goes from, it's about tangent here and here, it goes from negative pi over 4 to pi over 4 in this direction um, to sweep out one petal of this curve and then there's four others, there's one on each coordinate axis. So we want to find the area of one of these and you can check that this is truly given, this is the graph of r equals cosine of 2 theta. Okay. So based on the work that we just did on the last slide, the area of this region is going to be one-half 
integral around the boundary curve, r squared d theta. Okay, but really the boundary curve is already, it's already been parameterized, so really we just need to plug in the boundary, uh, the boundary values for theta. And so this becomes one-half integral minus pi over 4 to pi over 4 of cosine 2 theta, that's the radius function, squared d theta. Cosine is an even function, and when it's squared it remains even. So we can actually just compute this as one of the integrals from 0 to pi over 4 cosine squared 2 theta d theta. And then we can use double angle formula, or power reducing formula I should say, to convert this to 1 half integral 0 to pi over 4, 1 plus cosine of 4 theta d theta. Okay, and then we can integrate. So this is 1 half theta from 0 to pi over 4, uh, plus uh, this becomes 1 eighth sine of 4 theta, 0 to pi over 4. And when we plug in, we get uh, pi over 8 minus 0, uh, plus sine of pi is 0, and sine of 0 is 0. So the area of one leaf of this four-leafed rose, one petal of this four-leafed rose, is just pi over 8. Okay, I hope this is helpful as you practice using Green's Theorem, and I'll see you next time.